Welcome, everybody. This is the Obligations of Memory podcast for the Jewish Culture and Holocaust Remembrance Group on Facebook and YouTube. My name is Jeffrey Geisner, and I'm going to be leading the uh, discussion today. I'm so excited to uh, have the full Grow family here, starting with Mrs. Grow, Rachel Grow, who's 98 and a survivor of Auschwitz. I have her uh, oldest son, Stephen Grow, the middle son, uh, Ron Grow, I have Michael Grow, and then I have Marilyn Grow with us. And so it is delightful. And, and not least, I have the third generation of the Grow family, and that is Seth Grow. So we are going to have a very interesting. Sorry, I, did I make a mistake? It's Seth Togel. Seth Togel. All right, I'm, excuse me, Seth Togel, so I'm sorry. Um, and um, let's get started. And I'm, we're gonna ask the first question of obviously the matriarch of the family, uh, Mrs. Grow. I wanna have you tell us a little bit about you growing up, where you grew up, how you grew up with siblings and your family. We know you were in Auschwitz, but we're not gonna talk about Auschwitz at all today. So just tell us about the fond memories that you had of your parents and your siblings. Well, I have some, <clears throat> I have some good memories and some not such a good ones. I, um, I was born in Romania in Maramures, the area called Maramures. That's where Eli Wiesel comes from, from Sigat Maramures. So um, it wasn't a very exciting life. It was a very backward life. My father, was a wonderful person and so was my mother and I only went eight grades to school that's all there was no more in, the, in town I would have had to go out of town and which I didn't um can you say your well, father's name and your my father's name? name was Alfred Wohl W-O-H-L and my mother's was Minga Wohl and it was it was not such a great life. We had no electricity. We had no running water. But it was a good life. My grandfather came from Galicia. He settled in our town and he married my grandmother and they had five boys and three girls. And nothing is left now of those uncles and aunts. And do you have, uh, did you grow up in a religious home? Were you, was your parents? Not very religious. Well, semi, semi. We observed Shabbat and holidays. We ate kosher. My grandfather was a very educated man. He was a Talmud. Um, so, I, so let me ask you another question, which I didn't prep, but I, it comes up in these questions. You've been with us almost a century. It's it's an it's a mitzvah that you are yeah. here that long. So, with all of and I don't want to hear anything about the camps, but I want to hear after the camp. You've seen so much change in in America. What highlights do you think about when you think about the the life you've led? and all of the technology changes that you've seen, what makes you, what stands out to you? Well, I'm sad in a way that the whole world stood still and let Hitler do whatever he wanted with us. Okay, obviously. And what about after the, what about currently? How about the, maybe Michael, you can explain the question. She's so asking what big changes in the world impress you the most, like any technology or what oh, changes, what, what, what sticks out in your mind? The whole Kabul law, <laughs> there's a lot of improvements which were never there before the war. Okay, very good. And so where did you meet your husband? Here in Michigan, in Detroit. Um, we belong to B'nai Brit. He belonged to the men's lodge and I belong to the women's chapter. We were raising funds for Israel. Okay, Steve, you wanted to say something? 
Here's the picture. Okay. okay. Oh, there's the picture. Very good. What a beautiful picture. And I, I heard some really amazing story that you, you, you uh, sleep with that pillow. Is that right? You sleep with the pillow? Yeah. Yeah. In the nighttime, I take it to bed. In the daytime, so I have it here on the couch. There you there you go. Of course I do. Yes. <laughs> yes. I I miss him terribly. He was a wonderful man. He nice. was born in Vienna. So you met you met in Detroit. And how long did you go out with each other before you were married? Several months, that's all. And then we got married. So why him? Because we were working on in the same organization. And we had dinner dances together, so we, and we got along well. So you like to dance? Yes. She still yeah. dances. <laughs> oh, right. That's no. fabulous. It's fabulous. Yeah. So you uh, met in Detroit. So when did you, um, you were married and uh, you uh, went, so you, live in, you lived in Detroit. And then when did you have your first child? Well, that was that was before they were married. She was married once before to another man, and that's when Steve was born in 1955. Nice. Okay. Yeah. And he, do you remember his name, Mom? Your first yeah, husband? Yeah, Abraham Rosen. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And, and then, unfortunately, he, he was from from Poland. He was from what do you call the city? Uh, Warsaw. No. Oh, I don't know. No. Maybe okay. Steve knows. Steve. Steve knows. Go ahead, Steve. He was from Lodge. Okay. And do you have any memories of your father? My memories are very, very vague because he passed when I was just barely 18 months old. And prior to that, he was sick for about six months. It was really, as far as cancer goes, it was quick. But so it was too young for me to leave an impression. Um, and Charlie was the only man I knew and called. Okay, so maybe you can help, uh, Mike. Tell us a little bit about your father, where he where he grew up, and perhaps some of it, his uh, Holocaust journey. Okay, mine. Or... So our father was uh, Charles Martin Grow, or actually, the original his birth name was Carl Martin Gross, and that was the name he was given when he grew up. He was born in Vienna in 1924, the same year that Rachel was born, but a little later in the year, in September. And that's where he lived. He lived a, a pretty good life. Uh, the family was, was fairly well off. I would say upper middle class and so forth. They had a business. His father had a shipping business. He went to school. He did very well in school. He was considered you know, like a gifted child. And then when the Nazis came in uh, 1938, he was only 14 years old. But they saw the writing on the wall. His family did, his parents. And especially after Kristallnacht in late 1938, they said, we need to get out of here. And so the three of them did, and they got on what is literally, literally a slow boat to China because back, and they left in 1939. It took a few months to get the papers together. So in 1939, if you were Jewish, there were very few places you could go in the world and, and move to as a resident without a visa, and China was one of them. So mm -hmm. that's where they went. They could only take so much money with them. I think it was a really small amount, something like 10 10 German marks or Austrian marks, which is nothing. So they took, so they didn't take very many belongings, whatever they could fit in a couple of suitcases. So they sold a lot of their belongings and bought first class tickets on a slow boat to China. So they took it, and the three of them went, and my father also had a brother, so his parents had another son, who went on the kinder transport to England. So he was a few years older and he went on his own to England. Charlie was only 14 and he went with his parents to China. So they took a train from Vienna to Italy, to Northern Italy, and then they got on a boat from Italy all the way down and around to China. It was about a 30 day voyage to Shanghai. And then when they got in Shanghai, they were very, very, very shortly and somebody told them, get out of Shanghai, things are getting dangerous here, go to Qingdao. So they followed this person's advice and it was a good thing they did because the Japanese invaded Shanghai and they were really cracking down on all foreigners but they didn't quite make it to Qingdao until later. So they went to Qingdao where they settled. And uh, my dad more or less became the breadwinner for the family as a teenager, because none of them spoke Chinese when they got there, as you can imagine, they spoke German. And he was a teenager though, he quickly picked up the language. 
and he got a job working there. I think he worked at a bellhop in a hotel, actually. And uh, the other way they got money is they rented a house with several bedrooms and they took in boarders and rented out the other bedrooms to these boarders. And so that's how they made a living too. So that's how they, uh, they made a living and survived in a totally- And wasn't, you, wasn't your father in some type of a business also? Yeah, so that was later. So eventually, like I said, he worked at a hotel and then um, and before the war broke out and before the US got involved in the war, the military would come to Qingdao for like R&R &R in the summer. And so he started a bar called Charlie's Joint. <laughs> and uh, I'm not quite sure on the timing, but I think that's when it, when it first started, was sort of like in the early 40s. So again, he wasn't that old in the, uh, in then uh, before the war broke out and he would sell whiskey and beer to these military. And by then he'd learned English. He'd already learned some English in school, but he had worked more and learned a lot from the military. So here, we're, here you have this English speaking person in the middle of this town in China, so that's where all the American military men would go to get their drinks. So it became Charlie's Joint. It became very popular. Nice. <laughs> then the war broke out. Then the U.S. joined the war and the military stopped coming there for a while. Uh, but apparently they came back after the war and, uh, and business was good again. And he stayed there for a few more years and, and got some money together. And it wasn't until 1948 that they were then able to get a visa for the three of them to go to the States because in the meantime, uh, his aunt and uncle, which I'll describe in a minute, uh, had, had, had gotten to Detroit. Somehow they got out of Vienna before it was too late after Charlie's family had gone to China and before it was too late, they had gotten some distant relatives in the US to sponsor them. So they got out before the war and they touched with my grandparents. And after the war, they themselves were able to sponsor our grandparents and our father to go. And they were very close, uh, my grandparents and our aunt and uncle, because Sister and brother married brother and sister. So they were they were 100 percent related. Yeah. So brother-in-law, brother-in-law was brother-in-law. It's it's kind of, so their cousins, their their children were 100 percent blood related first cousins. So they were very, very close family. So that's how they made it to the States. And it's interesting how they got here, actually, because they actually came to Detroit, you know, from China through San Francisco. And how they arrived was actually on a military transport. Now, how they got on a military transport, I have no idea, <laughs> but somehow my father finagled it and they got a military transport from Shanghai to San Francisco and then got, uh, I believe it was on a train from San Francisco to Detroit and that's where they settled. So they sort of, my parents sort of, our parents sort of circumnavigated the globe in opposite directions because they spoke, both came from the Austria, Hungary, Romania area era. My father's family went east to China, San Francisco, Detroit, and my mother went west you know, to Germany, and then I think London, New York, and then Detroit. Very interesting. So the uh, the fact that you are all on, this, on our uh, Zoom here together, let me ask you, uh, collectively, you can all answer for yourselves, what was it like to grow up in a survivor's home? Who wants to take that question for? I'll let somebody else speak first. It was different than my, my memories go back a little bit more than my my siblings because I'm obviously a little bit older. Um, you know, it, the hardest thing was you realize right away my parents have a funny accent or my friends' parents do not. We didn't speak about the Holocaust a whole lot, but anytime a special came on TV, whatever we were watching got changed and the Holocaust came on. Um, we had a very frugal life. We weren't orthodox, we were very spiritual. We observed in a spiritual way, try to live not a pious life, but a good moral life. But part of that, in fact, has to do with Charlie, very strong ethics, very strong fair play kind of a guy. Now I know that you're, that Charlie and you're, and Mrs. Grow, you were in business together, correct? Yes. Yeah, they, they, yeah, he actually started off in the dry goods business. He put his parents in business. And uh, then he went on the road to be a salesperson. And my grandmother tried to set him up with somebody else, and that didn't work out. And then he met my mom <laughs> and kind of said, I'm going to walk my own walk and do my own thing. And 
she fell in love with the traveling salesman, so to speak. So in, in a sense, you have a very unique situation because you had grandparents in Detroit yes. that were Holocaust survivors. And My, yes. your parents um, were survivors. So this, this is a very unique situation. So I, I don't want to, anything to add, Ron or Marilyn, to what um, Steve said to you about growing up? Each of you were probably have some differences on growing up in a home of survivors. And we'll talk about your grandparents in a second. Anything that you want to contribute? Well, I always say what a small world it is because when Mike, reiterating back to what Michael mentioned, my father's bar in China, Charlie's Joint, we had a friend that lived a couple doors down Their Last name was Metivier. And Mr. Metivier, Don, was in the Navy, if I, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. And one day, his son, David, and I were uh, discovering things in his parents' basement that we didn't think we would find. It was a cigar box. And when I opened the cigar box, lo and behold, on the top of all these business cards was a card that said Charlie's Joint. No kidding. So I always say what a small world it is. Mm -hmm. And I brought it to my father's attention. And then those two had a, a meeting like no other because Don doesn't remember my dad because the war was a blur <laughs> because they were going there on Liberty. They don't, you know, remember too many things like that. Um, but so yeah, really nothing significantly about the Holocaust itself, but just the people that were brought into our lives, the interconnections, that's the most amazing thing. Okay, Marilyn, go ahead. Um, I'm touching on what, what Steve had said, you know, I'm the youngest of the four kids and what I remember, and I forgot until Steve said it, you know, um, being a first generation American, all my friends' parents were, um, their parents were American. I didn't have friends who, for the most part, that had survivor parents. And their parents had them, maybe my friends' parents were 23, 24, 25. When my friends were born, their parents were about in their early to mid 20s. My mom had me at the age of 41. So she was quite a bit older. Nowadays, that's very common. But back in 1965, when I was born, um, I was very aware that my parents were much older. My mother and father were both born in the same year. So they were 41 when I was born and they had a foreign accent. And I was always really embarrassed that they were from another country when I was growing up. Um, my father didn't talk about the Holocaust because he wasn't in a concentration camp. He talked about China and he cooked Chinese food for us. And it was exciting to hear his stories, but my mother didn't really talk about the war. Even to this day, it's like pulling teeth. It's a very hard thing for her to do. So in the home growing up, she didn't talk about it a lot. So when she did, I really listened and paid attention because it was very few and far between when, when mom would feel comfortable enough to talk about it. I'm sure you guys agree with me, my brothers. Um, but one thing I remember is that my mom would say everything for the kinderlach, meaning everything for my children. My mother and father are the type of people that would give anybody the shirt off their back, take in strays, which my brother Michael and some of my family are very good about welcoming people. My Steve and Bonnie are very much about Shabbat and having a community. And it's because our parents always said everything for the kinderlach, for the children. They save their money so that they could buy us homes or put us through school, put clothes on our back, buy us cars. We came from a very meager, um, lower middle class family in a suburb of Detroit, but we didn't know that we weren't wealthy. We are children of depression era parents born in the 1920s. So you ate every scrap on your plate. You didn't waste things. My father always liked a good deal. Never pay retail. That's what he taught us. He owned a clothing store. He and my mother had a women's clothing store. He had to push my mother to take clothing from his clothing store and wear it. She didn't want to spend on herself. She didn't want for herself. That's what I remember. Well, as you were talking about Kinderlach, I, I looked at your mom's smiling face. So she was very pleased to hear those stories. So let me go back and ask you this again. Can I, 
Can yeah. I, can I, can I respond? I didn't really get a chance. Okay. So I just wanted to say a couple of things. So one, I remember growing up, you know, again, as Marilyn had mentioned, being aware that, that I was first generation and our, our parents were immigrants. And as kids can kind of be cruel, I remember sort of making fun of our mother's accent because she, she pronounced her W's as V's and so forth. Whereas our father had no accent whatsoever. You would not know. He talked like a regular Midwesterner. Just no, people didn't know where, where he's from. He didn't have a New York accent. No, no accent at all. So I didn't make fun of him, but it was always fun making fun of her. But like I said, now looking back, maybe it was a little cruel, but you didn't really know any better. And I don't, I don't remember being ashamed of that though. I just remember finding it entertaining, you know, sort of giving her some ribbing and giving her a hard time and sort of mimicking her. So it was more like that, which I guess, you know, they say imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. But anyway, so I remember that. And the second thing is Marilyn made another really good point too. I don't remember our lives being as uh, affected as much as by them surviving the war as I think it was affected by them being depression era children. Because again, remember they were born in 24, they lived through 29 to the 30s and they were just young children there. And it's like, you didn't waste anything. You didn't throw anything away. There was nothing that, uh, and because of that, you know, they saved a lot of things too. I remember you saved rubber bands and paper clips. You don't throw them away because, you know, you just don't throw anything away. So I, that, that affected me more and had more of an impact uh, than them as survivors. And then maybe one third point I want to make is I always remember trying to get them to teach us Yiddish because that's how they would speak to each other when they didn't want us kids to know what they were saying. And I wanted to know what they were saying, <laughs> but they said, no, no, you're going to be American children. We don't want you to speak Yiddish. We don't want you to have an accent. We want you to blend in and be just like everybody else. And so it was a little frustrating. They wouldn't teach us, but you know, what are you going to do? It's funny that my parents had that spoke seven different languages and that she would, they would completely switch the language so we couldn't understand what they were saying. So let me go back to your grandparents for a second. What are the memories that your grandparents instilled in you? Because very rare that you have survivor grandparents. So you, again, I'll open it up to all of you to make a contribution. You can decide how you're gonna present it, but I'm really interested in that you knew your grandparents and what, present, and what their contributions to your lives were. First thing I remember about my grandparents, it comes to memory is grandpa had the sense of humor and grandma had the, the how would I call it, a more genteel manner. She was always very easygoing. Grandpa was a little neurotic. Grandma would calm him down. Grandpa was, you know, I would I don't want to call him a hypochondriac, but he was real close to it. But he also a very intelligent man. He spoke several languages. And he could tell a joke like no other. And grandma, she kept trying to cook, never quite got the hang of it. That's <laughs> did, you, did your grandparents have a, a work here or they were retired? At well, like I said, my, my father set them up in a dry goods business. In, in, uh, I think it was off of, um, it was in the inner city of Detroit. And uh, they ran it, so to speak, to milk it dry while he got a job as a traveling salesman to supplement the income that they were taking from the business. Grandma was not a good businesswoman. Grandpa was, but his health prevented him from putting in the hours and the labor. So basically, dad wore two hats. He worked part-time sales and part-time sales. He was not a lazy guy. He did whatever it took to support the family, and he did it well. And how about anybody else with impressions of grandparents? I was pretty time. close. I was yeah. pretty close. To my grandparents. I would go on vacations with them. We'd go on fishing trips over to Canada. Yeah. And um, I remember traveling when they moved to Florida, even spending some long summers there. Did they, and I'll add this to the question, did they provide you any wisdom that you use today that you can sort of tackle, tack on and say, oh, I remember my grandparents, that's what they used to do. The, the only thing that my grandmother taught me is be careful what stories you tell. If it's considered too much of a lie, no one's going to believe you. The boy, the boy who cried wolf was her favorite one to tell me. I guess I was somewhat of a stretcher of truth, shall we say. And the other thing she said is, you know, keep family members 
keep family information private. You don't share with anyone. I was proud that I opened up a bank account. I think it was 11 years old or 12 years old. I had $25 in or whatever. And my grandmother pulled me inside. You don't tell people those kinds of things. I don't know if that's depression mentality or afraid because a Hitler would come and take it or whatever. But it was like, okay, you know, if you were the matriarch of the family, I'm just going to listen, you know, and that's really what it is. I also learned that two women in the same kitchen don't always get along. <laughs> Let me go to Seth. Seth, you wanted to add something. Yeah, I, I, obviously, I don't have any memories of your grandparents. Um, but Steve, you you telling the story about not being able to keep, you know, personal matters personal uh, in that sense, uh, the story of being proud to open up a bank account, you know, hearing the, the values or at least the teachings that they've instilled into you takes me back immediately to the trip that I took with my confirmation class to New York. And I bought a tag hero watch on the side of the Empire State Building. And almost right, word for word. You can't leave you, us there. You've got to tell us more of the story. Come on. I, so, I mean, so I went, uh, I went on a confirmation trip with my temple, with my, my confirmation class. We went to New York City. We toured a whole bunch of different synagogues and everything. We were there for, I don't know, maybe three or four days or something like that. Not a very long trip or anything, but um, with a whole bunch of my classmates. And I bought a Tag Heuer watch. I was really excited for it. It was, you know, a total knockoff. Um, bought a Tag Heuer watch. And I paid like fifteen dollars for it, and I, and it was a great deal, right? Because Papa Charlie said you don't pay retail prices, <laughs> and I sure couldn't afford a, a legit tag hewer. But I came home and I was like, Steve, look what I got! I got a tag hewer watch. He goes, Wow, that's really cool. I got it on the side of the Empire State Building. I paid fifty. He goes, Don't don't go like spout off about that. He was like, You don't need to tell everyone that kind of stuff. <laughs> so you think about that generation. That instilled to Nana and Papa, that instilled to the grow kids, that instilled now to me, which I now have the fortunate opportunity to be able to share with my daughter when she goes to tell all of her friends about the new toys and tchotchkes and stuff that she gets. So well, I just I think, wanted to. I think that's a great story, and I hope I hope this stimulates some other storytelling because I'm gonna I'm gonna get it out of you one way or the other. So um, go ahead, Mike. So I wanted to answer your question about you know, our grandparents. So the first thing is, you know, I was a little younger than Ron. So I, I don't think I was quite as close to them because they, they passed away when I was like a teenager. But I also remember trips to Florida once they moved away to Florida when I was about 12 or 13. So I do remember that. But I was never very close to our grandfather because as Steve had mentioned, he was always sort of sickly. And actually, I remember towards the end, you know, he always walked with a cane and then a wheelchair. And he was, he became very frail and sickly. But also, uh, he mostly spoke German. His English was not so good, so I had trouble understanding him. So I never felt very close to him. He was always this sort of distant, cold, you know, German to me. And uh, whereas our grandmother spoke perfect English, and she spoke it very well, had an excellent vocabulary, and she was sort of warmer and, and fuzzier, and so I felt a little closer to her. So the one thing I remember learning from her is when I did go and visit them with Florida, she was an avid swimmer. She would be in the pool every day swimming her laps, and that's how she stayed in shape. And that got me interested in swimming. And to this day, I still enjoy swimming you know, very much. And I, I think of her sometimes. And then the last thing, sort of something I remember you asked, asked earlier uh, from our father, Charlie, is you know, having lived in China for, for 10 years, whenever we went, he had, he had his opinions about Chinese restaurants and Chinese food. And I always remember him saying, if you go into a restaurant and there's no Chinese people eating there, get out. <laughs> Do not either. Only the Chinese restaurants where Chinese people eat and the menus are in Chinese. So I still carry that with me. You know what? I must have known your father because I, I think the same way. So it's funny. <laughs> Go ahead, Marilyn. Um, thank you. So um, one thing I want to talk about my grandparents, but before I do, I wanted to circle back when I first talked about how growing up I was self-conscious because my parents were so much older than all my friends' parents and that they had foreign accents. Um, which my friend's parents did not, those are the things that I'm most proud of now as an adult. My father lived to be 95. My mother is 98 and knock on wood, still going strong. And so I'm so proud of their age, that, that they lived a wonderful long life. Hopefully my brothers and I come from those good roots and that they are from another country. We, we've seen things that I think when you grow up, 
with American parents, maybe you just don't even realize. And had I not had a Holocaust survivor mother, I, it wasn't taught to me in school. I wouldn't have known what the Holocaust was. It was touched on a little in Hebrew school, but being a descendant of a Holocaust survivor, I have firsthand stories. And every time I tell someone, if it comes up, even from when I was a kid, my mother's a survivor, people want to know a survivor. It's like they're some mythical creature and people have a curiosity. And that's why I appreciate my mother. Mom, I'm so proud of you for participating because you're one of the last that can give testimony that you really are for real because people deny it. So that's one thing I wanna say. I'm very proud of, to be a daughter of a survivor. Another thing is about my grandparents. So my father growing up in Vienna, Jeffrey, he, was, he grew up in a very cosmopolitan town. Vienna was the center of Europe in the 1920s when he was born. The, 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 sim, the orchestras, the symphonies, Mozart, all the great composers, the opera house, um, finance, um, everything. You, um, Vienna was the center of cosmopolitan life. So my father grew up in a very big city and my mother grew up in a town that I like to compare to Fiddler on the Roof, not a shtetl, but a village. So when you were asking what kind of things were remarkable to her, an automobile, if it ever came through, mom, tell me if, if this is wrong, but they had horses and carriages. So if a car ever happened to go by her village, everyone ran to see an automobile, right, mom? Yeah. It was, you know, it was literally Fiddler on the Roof. A milkman came to bring milk. Her father worked in a lumber yard as a foreman where they chopped wood and made lumber. It was very, very rustic. Whereas my father grew up, I'm sure, in a house with electricity. He had a governess. They would go to a summer place and have summers. They had dogs. They had a governess. My mom, the animals they had were farm animals that, you know, goats and chickens and horses and cows. So they had all their produce fresh from their farm, right, mom? You had eggs. Yeah. You made bread for Shabbat. They made everything over a kitchen fire, you know, an oven, a wood burning oven, very different lives. So much so that my father didn't even know he was Jewish. They had a Christmas tree in their home growing up. And my grandmother knew that they were Jewish, but in order to have my father have a better shot at life, because anti-Semitism was around from when my father was born, he did not have a bris. So you understand that this is, if ever there were to be a time where he would have to prove that he was Christian, he could do so, if you read between the lines and understand what I'm saying. Do you know what the dates that you're referring to, what date of the, what years those were? Well, he was born in 1924. So until he went to China in 1939, they were assimilated. They had a Christmas tree. They did not, my father was not bar mitzvah. They didn't go to Hebrew school. They were assimilated and, you know, and, and blended in and, and just he, oh, when they married, my father grew up eating pork chops and bacon. My mother grew up in an Orthodox home. She, she, um, you know, marriage is about compromise. We grew up eating bacon. We did not eat milk and meat, but we did not grow up in a kosher house. My father grew up not understanding what kosher is. So to make her husband happy, we ate everything. We had, we did have cheeseburgers. We had, you know, it was a very assimilated life for us as well. I don't know if you, my brother share and can concur, but this is my memories. And my, my grandparents were wonderful. My grandmother was gorgeous. She was a beauty. And my grandfather pursued her and begged her that's my grandfather and my grandmother. My, gra my grandfather begged her, you know, I will not live if you don't marry me. He was more of a crotchety guy. He was older than his years. And she was this vibrant beauty that men sought after. Right, mom? Grandma was a beauty. Yep. Yeah. She was gorgeous and she loved to dress and she was loved to have her hair done. And he eventually wore her down and she agreed to marry him, but she was not a traditional woman. She really had a mind of her own. And um, they had an interesting marriage because he worshiped her. That's what it was, he worshiped her. And I wanna add on to that. I don't wanna cut you off, but Marilyn, if I may? Yeah. Okay, so Jeffrey, I, I wanted to speak to say just a couple of things. 
So you make a, a good point. Uh, am I showing up on the screen? Yep. Okay, some reason I didn't see it. Okay, uh, Marilyn, you, you make a good point and you made me realize something and I meant to mention this. There's a big difference uh, between our grandmother and our mother. So our mother and our father, everything was for the children. Whereas I think for our grandparents, everything was for our grandmother. It was all about her. And I don't mean that in a nasty way. I'm just saying the way she was brought up and everything. And I want to share with you a picture. So this was their, the picture from their wedding day. Hmm. So you can sort of see even there, you can see the grumpy man as our grandfather and the sort of glamorous woman you know, as our grandmother. And I think that sort of captures and, their And essence. wearing a fur. What's, yes, on her wedding day, she is wearing a, a fur. Right. Yes. So let me do this. I'm going to bring this first episode to a close. This has been fast 30 minutes. You're listening to the um, Obligations of Memory podcast for the Jewish Culture and Holocaust um, Remembrance Group on Facebook and YouTube. I'm speaking with the Grow family, inc including the matriarch, Mrs. Grow, who's 98. And we're going to be coming back for episode two in a minute. Uh, so hang in. We'll see you soon.